Okay, let's go ahead and get this week going. So we left off on Friday trying to rush through the global biogeochemical cycle that regulates uh, nitrogen cycling in the, in the world. And so we talked for a long time about nitrogen fixation, which is by definition the process whereby atmospheric dinitrogen is turned into a biologically usable form in the form of ammonia. But then ammonia needs to be cycled into other biological usable forms and then ultimately back into nitrogen. So the last things that we were talking about was a process known as nitrification, which is done collaboratively by two syntrophic groups of bacteria. Uh, one that does nitrosification, such as the nitrosomonas, which takes am ammonia and turns it into nitrite. And then finally, the second half of that syntrophic pair are the nitrobacter group, so always having the prefix nitro in front of them. These are the organisms that finish that off. They take nitrite and turn it into nitrate, thereby allowing nitrosomonas um, and that group of microbes to continue to oxidize um, ammonia. Now recognize, as I told you on Friday, that this is an energy source for these microbes. These microbes are using ammonia and oxidizing it. So the same way that we're oxidizing breakfast right now, they're um, using this as an electron donor a, as their energy. Now, the other half of this process, which keeps uh, all of the nitrogen in the globe from ending up tied up in the earth or in, or in the oceans, is a process shown on the bottom half of this, pro this, this sphere called denitrification. Now, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't want to leave nitrification yet. I want to talk a little, I forgot what my, what my slides were. It's Monday morning. Um, I want to give you a couple of reasons why it's important to understand nitrification, because for those of you who are aquarium enthusiasts, or if you even just like visiting aquari you know, large aquaria, microbes are really critically important for the functioning of aquaria, because fish produce as their nitrogenous waste product ammonia. Uh, because it's highly water soluble, fish can can um, do that. But at high concentrations, it's actually toxic for the, for the fish. So in aquaria, it's very important that you have this group of microbes in there that can do nitrification because they have to take that toxic ammonia and turn it into the much less toxic form of nitrate. So nitrate is not as toxic, if toxic at all, for fish. So for for aquaria enthusiasts, that's that's really important. And nitrification, this process whereby um, ammonia is turned into nitrates and, and nitrites, is actually really important agriculturally. So I, I mentioned if any of you are into farming or you know, small-scale small gardening, you may, if you're not an organic um, person, may be fertilizing with something like uh, miracle Grow or uh, Vigoro or something like that. That has a lot of nitrates in it. But um, nitrates are actually not the best thing to put into soil, at least in terms of large-scale commercial interests, because nitrates are highly water-soluble. And so farmers, commercial farmers, don't tend to put nitrates into their soil. Uh, instead, what they do is they put ammonia into their soil, because if they just put nitrates in, um, they would simply wash away the first time it, it rained. So, in fact, um, putting in ammonia allows that to, to adhere to the soil because ammonia, under neutral, pH neutral conditions, exists largely as the ammonium ion, so it's positively charged. And so clay particles in the soil are negatively charged. And so ammonium tends to stick quite well to, to clay. So commercial farmers actually put things into their soil to inhibit the process of nitrification. They're actually putting in chemicals which inhibit the microbes that use ammonia as an energy source and turn it into nitrates, or at least to slow it down, because that way nitrates aren't lost due to, to water. 
The nitrates, when they're produced, are negatively charged, so they don't bind to the clay. That's part of the reason why they're so easily uh, washed away by, by soil. And it's actually very important that we don't let nitrates get into groundwaters because they're actually toxic. Nitrates in the groundwater, if they end up in our drinking water, are actually uh, problematic inside of our intestinal tract. You've all done the nitrate test with E. coli. And remember that every one of the gram-negative enteric bacteria that you're working with for your unknowns, it's a given. They are all nitrate positive. You don't need to do the nitrate test on those. So most of the enteric gram-negative bacteria that live within our intestinal tract love to get a hold of nitrate because they can use it to do respiration. They can do anaerobic respiration. With no nitrate and no oxygen, they have to live fermentatively. But if your water that you're consuming has nitrate in it, the bacteria will use that nitrate um, like E. coli will and reduce it to nitrite. Nitrite is a problem for a couple of reasons. One is that it has a very high affinity for hemoglobin. So for you and I, that's not so much of a problem, but um, you can actually um, inhibit blood, or excuse me, oxygen supplies to, to young children if there's much nitrogen in the water that they're consuming because the microbes will break that down into nitrites, which will compete with hemoglobin for oxygen. So you can get blue baby syndrome. Now, most of the times when you hear the term blue baby syndrome, that usually refers to um, some type of a congenital heart um, abnormality that, that occurred during embryogenesis. But another, another um, cause of, of blue baby syndrome is the, the inability to get enough oxygen so the child actually develops a, a, a bluish color, kind of a, I think it's called uh, capnophilia or something like that. I forget the exact term. But the other potential major problem with this is, is it potentially promotes colon cancer because nitrites can be broken down into nitrosic guanines which are known to be intestinal carcinogens. So, so it's important that nitrates not get into soil, uh, or excuse me, not get into our drinking water very easily. OK, now let's go on to the bottom half of this sphere and talk about denitrification. Why is it that not all of the atmospheric nitrogen has been trapped in the earth and in, and in the ocean? And that's what's happening on the bottom half of this. So th these are processes which happen um, anaerobically, so in the absence of, of oxygen. We just really kind of hinted at that when I was talking about nitrates in the water and the bacteria in our intestinal tracts using nitrates as the terminal electron acceptor, reducing them to nitrites. The process that's going on here at the bottom, denitrification, is inherently very different than the process on the top. Nitrification, remember, is using bacteria that are chemolithotrophic bacteria. They're using chemical energy, and that energy, the electron sources, is coming from an inorganic molecule, from, nit from ammonia. They're oxidizing ammonia to generate nitrite. The process is, is the opposite on the bottom. All of the processes, at least so far as I know, on the bottom here, which break down nitrate into nitrite, into nitrous oxide, eventually into nitrogen gas, are all respiratory. So these are bacteria that are using these nitrogen products as their terminal electron acceptors. So like E. coli that has the ability to re reduce nitrate to nitrite. Other microbes have the ability to reduce it further to nitric oxide. Yeah, how many times can I make you look at the respiratory chain of Paracoccus to nitrificans? So here's, here's yet another bite at that apple in case you, in case you haven't had enough of this. So this is um, one of the poster children, if you will, for microbes that, um, bless you, that do this process of denitrification. So Paracoccus denitrificans under anaerobic conditions, so if oxygen is not present, but nitrate is, can use one of its several um, different reductases. So it can start off, if nitrate is present, it can use NAR, or nitrate reductase. So it can put electrons at, in its electron transport chain onto nitrate to produce nitrite, and that, help, that allows it to respire. When it's used up all of the nitrate and reduced it into nitrite, it can switch over and use nitrite reductase, NIR, shown here, I think. Yeah. Uh, nitrite re reductase can take that 
nitrite, reduce it to nitric oxide. Once the nitrite is all used up, no problem. It just switches over and uses uh, another terminal reductase, nitric oxide reductase, or NOR, shown here, that takes nitric oxide, reduces it into nitrous oxide, um, and conventionally take it all the way down to atmospheric <coughs> nitrogen. So this is the process shown in one bacterium in one electron transport chain. That's why I call it the poster child for denitrification, because this bacterium has the capability within its anaerobic electron transport chain to do the entire process of denitrification. So, so atmospheric nitrogen is now um, going back into the atmosphere, having run the gamut, starting with ammonia, going through nitrification, now all the way through denitrification. So this is different than the process um, whereby the same bacterium in the presence of oxygen doesn't use those processes. Instead, it uses oxygen when it's present. So, so as I mentioned, this process is by definition, or obligatorily, that's not the right word, um, it is obligately anaerobic. Because if oxygen is present, denitrification will not occur. Because these microbes will use oxygen in the, instead of, nit instead of um, nitrogen pro products. OK. In a way, I'm kind of walking away from the nitrogen cycle at this point. Um, what you're about to see is one of the most awkward pedagogical transitions ever seen for going between two different biogeochemical cycles. What I should just say is we're done with the nitrogen cycle, let's talk about the carbon cycle. But instead, let me try and make kind of a very awkward transition. It gets, doesn't get any less awkward the more I talk about it. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about a relationship between the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle as a way to, to get us into the carbon cycle. So the bacteria that we were talking about that did nitrification, specifically the group of microbes nitrosomonas, which started off our whole discussion of the nitrogen cycle, which oxidized ammonia to nitrite. By definition, that is the term nitrosification. They use an enzyme called ammonia. Ammonia. <laughs> definitely Monday. Ammonia. Monooxygenase, AMO. Um, if you look at an electron micrograph of nitrosomonas, as shown here, you can see it's kind of a diplococci, um, looks a little bit like, it's a gram-negative bacterium, looks a little bit like gonococci. Um, but it has lots of thylakoid-type membranes, so invaginations of the cytoplasmic membrane. Because in order to use ammonia, as an electron source, as an energy source, it needs a lot of membrane potential to do that. It needs a lot of electron transport chain potential in order, in order to do this. So, it, so it's evolved this high degree of thylakoid membranes. Now, let's look at a, an unre yeah, kind of an unrelated group of microbes. They're still gram-negative bacteria. They're still in this proteobacter phylum. Um, but these microbes shown on the right-hand side are, you'll notice they both have the prefix methylo. When you see the term methylo, this is an organism that can, um, in this case, oxidize methane. So CH4 can be used as a carbon source by, by these bacteria. So these are microbes, these two microbes that are shown, that I put pictures up here, are methanotrophic bacteria. Do not confuse those with methanogenic archaea. Methanogenic archaea, genic, meaning genesis, meaning they make methane. These are organisms that are methanotrophic. They eat methane. So they have the capability of oxidizing methane. They can oxidize methane, recognize that this is a highly reduced molecule, uh, so there's lots of energy to be recouped from this. They oxidize it into CO2 using an enzyme called methane monooxygenase. And you'll notice in these microbes, they have extensive thylakoid membranes as well, these invaginations of their membranes. Now, here's the, here's the connection. It's not just a morphologic similarity between them. Methanotrophic bacteria, their enzyme, methane monooxygenase, is actually inhibited by ammonia. If ammonia is present, it will turn around and oxidize ammonia rather than methane. So they have to live, you know, exclusive. They, they can't um, survive very well around, around ammonia. So this kind of begs the question of what's the relationship between of nitrosomonas 
with these methanotrophic bacteria. In reality, what we know now is that this is an example of horizontal gene transfer between relatively unrelated microbes. So this um, MMO, the meth methane monooxygenase, actually originated at, from nitrosomonas-related bacteria, the ammonia monooxygenase, but it's been acquired by another bacterium and the course of evolution has adapted it slightly so that it can now oxidize a different substrate. It can now oxidize methane, CH4, as opposed to nitrogen, NH4. Remember that carbon and nitrogen are next to one another on the periodic table. So maybe this isn't a major change between them. But the, the enzyme remains similar enough such that the new form, the more, the more highly evolved form um, that's in the methanotrophic bacteria can actually still be inhibited by ammonia. It will still um, bind to, to ammonia. So these organisms have, have um, adapted, or, or excuse me, have, have evolved from a related function. Okay. Yeah, that was an awkward transition. We are done with transitions. We're done with talking about the nitrogen cycle. I just want to finish up talking a little bit about the carbon cycle, only because I've introduced the, the um, concept that methane is a very dangerous greenhouse gas. And we saw a video where methane is being released from the permafrost, and so we may actually be approaching a tipping point. So if methane is released in large amounts into the environment, the um, global warming may, may actually accelerate, which will melt more permafrost, which will release even more methane. So since I'm probably keeping you up at night worrying about the world getting warmer and, and methane being released, I want to talk a little bit about how it's supposed to work. So, so in reality, methane, when it's produced by archaea, is not designed, it's not meant to escape into the atmosphere. It's meant to be part of this cycling, staying within, oftentimes, within aquatic environments. So, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there are bacteria that are methanotrophic. They love methane. Methane is delicious. It's a wonderful carbon source for these, for these organisms. So they're taking methane, oxidizing it into CO2 um, on all of those internal membranes. These microbes are incredibly widespread in the soil and in the water. And one of the really cool things, there's not many cool things that arose from the BP um, Deepwater Horizon um, event, the Deep Star Horizon event, rather, um, that killed people and then released massive amounts of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, as well as massive amounts, if you remember, of methane. You can remember seeing pictures from submersibles of seeing bubbles and bubbles of methane. Well, methane is very soluble in water. And what happened shortly after that term is microbiologists realized that there was a massive bloom of methanotrophic bacteria within the water column in the Gulf of Mexico. And within a matter of weeks, methane levels within the water returned to normal. So these bacteria just feasted upon this methane, um, keeping it from eventually going into to the atmosphere. Now, obviously, there was so much methane coming out of that blown well they couldn't eat all of it, so a lot of methane was actually released into, into the environment and probably is doing terrible things with, with global warming right now, trapping solar radiation. But it's not that the microbes weren't trying. These methylotrophic bacteria were really important at helping to clean up the methane. Other bacteria that we're not talking about right now actually used or, or are still using the petroleum as, as a carbon and, and energy source. But that's a different story. This is more of a balanced ecosystem. This is the way methane is supposed to be handled in a typical environment. And so the environment that I've chosen to talk about is um, wetlands. So especially in the northern hemisphere, um, there are peat bogs. So where I grew up, there are a lot of peat bogs. Um, and these are all based on sphagnum moss. And so you all know a little bit about sphagnum moss. Maybe you've used it in gardening. It's, it's a great thing to a uh, soil amendment to help hold water into um, sandy type soils. You shouldn't be using that because it's destroying peat bogs in, in the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere. But the way these peat bogs work is they're actually a highly balanced environment. There's a lot of organic matter from these sphagnum mosses, these bryophytes, being degraded as, it, as the plants die down in here, but very slowly. So, so what's happening is, is that as this organic matter falls into this wetland and bacteria 
begin to break down the cellulose and products of that sphagnum and, and other ma organic matter that wash into the wasteland um, or into the watershed. One of the things that occurs, of course, by the, by the actions of the archaea, the methanogenic archaea, is that methane is released and it comes into the water column. And you might think that it might just bubble up and the bubbles might pop at the surface here and release into the environment. But as long as this is going slowly enough, that methane actually becomes solubilized in the water. So these very tiny bubbles are actually, um, don't reach the surface, they dissolve in the water. Associated with the plant, there is a, a mutualist symbiotic organism, a bacteria, which is a methanotroph. So it's actually a guild of bacteria, it's not a single species. These are bacteria that are, that are loving this methane that's being released from the sediments slowly. They're oxidizing that methane as their food product, and they're releasing CO2, which you might think, well, that's a greenhouse gas too. But the CO2 doesn't end up in the atmosphere. As long as this ecosystem is not disturbed, as long as there's not too much carbon going in, the CO2, which ends up as the end product from these methanotrophic bacteria is actually used by the plants in photosynthesis. It's a major source of CO2 that these autotrophic organisms, these photosynthetic plants, are actually using to make carbohydrates. So in a well-balanced system like this, this methane never actually gets into the environment and neither does the CO2. It's trapped, it cycles within that, um, within that ecosystem very nicely. Another really cool ecosystem where um, that we really only started learning about probably since about 2000 um, is a marine environment called cold seeps. So we talked about um, hydrothermal vents earlier when we were talking about chemolithotrophic bacteria existing in, in mutualistic symbiotic um, relationship with, with tube worms. But actually, we know now that there are areas in the ocean where gases, methane gases and hydrogen sulfide gases are coming up um, bubbling up from, from the subsurface. And actually, it turns out that one of the largest cold seep environments ever noted or, or ever discovered so far is off the coast of Virginia and North Carolina in one of the canyons that's right along the edge of the um, continental shelf. These are areas where methane is, is coming off, it's bubbling up, and now mats of microbes, that's what's shown here on the right, um, which can oxidize methane, these are methanotrophic bacteria, now exist because they have large amounts of this CH4 that they can use as an energy source. But there are also um, symbiotic interactions, especially well-developed in bivalves, things like mussels. These mussels are even in the same genus of the mussels that you might eat when you go out to a restaurant, the middleus um, genus. These mussels never eat. They, don't, they, don't, they still filter feed. They still have gills, but they're not collecting anything with their gills. They, they, they have evolved away their complete digestive tract. Instead, what they have within the gills are bacteria that can use methane, that can oxidize methane. So the, the circulatory system and the filtering system of these mussels is actually meant designed to push water across the gills that's rich in methane, and these microbes living within the gills are oxidizing methane for their own use, to make their own energy, to make their own amino acids, but they're also giving part of that back to the, to the, um, to the clams, to these mussels. So all of the biomass of these mussels is all based on the oxidation of, these, uh, of methane by chemosynthetic bacteria. Even the tube worms that live here, the tube worms themselves um, are actually using still hydrogen sulfide because any place where you have something like methane coming off here, there's also hydrogen sulfide being given off. So, so those same, those same Riftia bacteria are actually getting hydrogen sulfide from the environment. But here, because there's not as much hydrogen sulfide in the water, they've actually, they actually root these... Um, Tube worms exist, they refer to them as tube worm bushes. They're not plants, but they grow in clusters. And so they have, they, they dig down with, um, I don't know exactly what their organs are that, that dig down into the um, soil in the subsurface and actually harvest hydrogen sulfide 
from from within the within the rocks. Here. So this these ecosystems have arisen very much like the hydrothermal vents, but now they're not based entirely on hydrogen sulfide oxidation. Instead, they're based on methane um, oxidation. So these are methanotrophic bacteria that, that are doing this. And now methanotro methanotrophic bacteria are a subset of microbes that are pretty unusual. These are um, methylotrophs. When you see the term methylotroph, by definition, what this means, and this is an unusual aspect to bacterial physiology, not many bacteria can do this. And it doesn't seem strange at first until you think about it, but these are organisms that can't break carbon-carbon bonds in their food. These are organisms that are dependent on C1 molecules, like methane, like um, things like methanol, methylamine. These are molecules that have carbon they're organic molecules, but they don't have carbon-carbon bonds. So methylotrophs, by definition, are microbes that can, um, can't use carbon-carbon compounds as their energy sources, so they use C1. So not all methanotrophs, so when we use the term methanotroph, we're talking about specifically about a microbe that can use methane. Um, so all methanotrophs are methylotrophs, but not all methylotrophs are methanotrophs because there are some that will use trimethylamine or, or methylamine, but not use, not use methane. So it's a very unusual group of microbes in that they can use organics, they just can't use them if there's been a carbon-carbon bond put, put into them. They can certainly make carbon-carbon bonds to put, um, put themselves together, but in terms of their diet, they can't use them. And yeah, one more, one more shot at Paracoccus denitrificans. why? Oh yeah, okay. Only because Paracoccus denitrificans, my, one of my favorite bacteria in the world, actually is, in a way, not, it doesn't fall into this methanotrophic, methylotrophic organism type, but it actually can use a one carbon molecule that it doesn't even take up. It can use methanol and oxidize it, use the electrons from methanol to feed into its electron transport chain. So it doesn't even need to take in food. It's, so I don't think somehow this quite makes this bacterium qualify as a, as a methylotrophic bacterium, but it's just another example of how microbes can use virtually any carbon source as, as an energy source. Okay, let's get away from um, biogeochemical cycling. Um, I love it, but I, it's, it, it can, yeah, I've just had enough of it. So what we're trying to do in this section on archaea and bacterial diversity is I'm trying to compare and contrast microbes. So genetically related or somewhat related bacteria that have very different lifestyles, life, life stories. And so now let's move on to one that may have more of an interest to, to many of you. Um, and if any of you are planning trips to Haiti anytime soon, this bacterium should have some great interest to you because since the, since the hurricane um, went across Haiti, there's been yet another outbreak of cholera. In, in Haiti. So if you're going, please get back to me, because I know some of you are going there over the semester break. Um, but Vibrio cholerae, the bacteria that causes epidemic cholera, is actually normally um, a brackish, or even an oceanic, oceanic bacterium. It's normally not pathogenic um, for anything. It lives associated with marine invertebrates, especially copepods in the environment. It's associated with the egg sacs. So far as I know, it doesn't cause them any disease. Um, but, and we'll talk about cholera later because it's a fascinating infectious disease organism, and we'll talk about it in more detail later in the class. Um, but it's only in humans that this bacterium becomes parasitic or, or pathogenic, and, and lethally so. So the planktonic, or living free in the, in the ocean water, on brackish water, Vibrio cholera, um, gets there largely because it's shed from humans either from the production of what's known as the most, one of the most disgusting terms, this is a legitimate medical term, rice water stool. I'll show you a picture of it in a little while. It doesn't look like anybody's rice, any rice that I ever cooked at, at my house, but somebody actually thought that stool from a cholera patient reminded them of, of rice water one time. So the term has stuck. Um, but also, as well as um, this very thin, very low viscosity stool, which ends up very easily from 
somebody who's infected um, washes very easily into water supplies, much more easily than solid stool would. Um, that actually contaminates water. But also, one of the other things that people don't realize about cholera is that um, the, poor, the poor unfortunate person who's, who has cholera is not only losing it from that end, they're also vomiting almost uncontrollably. So they're losing fluid from both ends, and both are tremendously, um, have tremendously heavy burdens of these bacteria. So the vomit is also incredibly infectious in, in cholera as well. And that's also very low viscosity, so that can get washed into water supplies uh, very, very easily. Um, so, so this is just kind of on the top here, uh, a little bit about the life cycle of Vibrio cholerae, this gram-negative bacterium. Um, it can get into environmental reservoirs. And so, you know, in, in many places in the world, particularly in South Asia, where uh, monsoons occur, it, part of the reason why the epidemic of cholera are tied to seasonally is because of the influx of ocean water that comes in, the storm surge that comes in with these really terrible typhoons. And it carries ocean water containing um, environmental reservoirs of this Vibrio and it contaminates drinking water. And so the people who survived the storm are now actually going to be insulted yet again because they're apt to have an outbreak of cholera because their water supplies have been contaminated. So then, once it's into the human host, coming from, you know, perhaps offshore in ocean water associated with copepod eggs, doing nobody any harm, gets into the human host, causes massive vomiting, massive diarrhea, ends up contaminating the water supply, and so it doesn't even need to be coming from the ocean at that point. It's just getting into well water. It's getting into, onto food and things like that, so people are infecting them, themselves. Cholera is also, and again, we'll talk in more detail at the more appropriate time in the class towards the end when we're talking about pathogenesis, um, but Vibrio cholerae is one of those really unusual bacteria in that its entire or, or its entire ability to cause disease depends on one thing and one thing only, and that's a toxin. So Vibrio cholerae actually at some point in its evolutionary history acquired a virus. The toxin gene that, that makes the cholera toxin that um, is, causes all of the diarrhea, causes all of the vomiting, is actually not even a bacterial protein. It's, it's part of a virus. Other strains of Vibrio cholerae that you can find in the environment that can never cause disease don't cause disease because they don't happen to be lysogenic. They don't happen to be infected by a particular virus that, is, that has the gene for this cholera toxin. So, and again, this is way off scale. Um, you can't imagine a bacteria in this size producing secreting toxin this big. That would kill it trying to pass that across the membrane. But the cholera toxin exists in two, as two different proteins, the A protein and the B protein. And A and B actually stand for something. They're not just like, oh, let's call one A, we'll call B. A stands for active, and B stands for binding. So the B fragment binds to a gangliocide on, that's abundant, especially on the surface of our gastrointestinal tract cell, gangliocide GM1. And that will induce retrograde endocytosis. So, so these material, this material will be taken in, and it will actually um, gain access through the Golgi apparatus and move backward through that, through that system. So that's what we mean by retrograde. And again, we'll talk about it. But at some point, the active form, the active protein, the A section, is actually extruded from the endoplasmic reticulum by a normal mechanism. So, so we have mechanisms th that recognize misfolded proteins in our um, Golgi and, and endoplasmic reticulum. And so we just recognize this as a protein that needs to be kicked out of the endoplasmic reticulum, like, like many do. And then it's going to bind to a regulatory subunit of adenyl cyclase, which is going to now cause adenyl cyclase to be constitutively on. So it's gonna be producing cyclic AMP, like there's no tomorrow which will interact with protein kinase A, not shown here, which will interact with the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, a chloride ion on the surface of enterocytes, uh, on the cells of your intestinal tract. And once this thing is constitutively turned on, it just pumps out chloride ions, just pumps them out like there's no tomorrow, which is problematic because what that does is it sets up an osmolarity gradient. If you're putting out all of this chloride in here, that's going to draw water behind it. 
That's the genesis of this really low viscosity, high volume fluid uh, diarrhea that, and, and vomitus that, that comes out. It's because all of this chloride is being pumped out. And actually, you know, so much is pumped out that you're not only losing water, but your electrolytes are, are way out of whack. And so what really kills people is not so much, well, it certainly is that they're dehydrated, but, but one of the major problems is that the electrolyte imbalance. This is why, you know, the treatment, it's Gatorade. You know, you don't treat people very often with cholera with antibiotics. Uh, it's re really supportive care. You just need to keep their fluid levels up and you need to keep their electrolytes in balance. So massive amounts of, of Gator Gatorade will, will help um, get people through that. This is what uh, somebody at one point thought looked like rice water. Um, or, or, yeah, it looked like rice water. This is cholera stool. Uh, looks more like a coffee milkshake to me. Um, that'll turn you off a coffee milkshake for a bit. But this, people actually will lose about 20 liters, 20 liters of fluid in a day. Um, so this is a really horrific disease. Untreated, without supportive care, as much as 50% of people who are infected with this are, are going to die. Uh, and as I mentioned, treatment is pretty much just oral rehydration. You know, just take care of people. Um, don't get infected yourself. Uh, keep their electrolyte balance up. These are the beds that they put people in, in um, during, during outbreaks. This is a picture from Bangladesh. Um, and you can see the little holes in the bottom of the tarps to, to allow the massive amounts of, of stool and vomitus to, to just pass down. And if that fluid is not properly treated in a septic system or in a um, wastewater treatment plant, if it's just going back into the ocean, if it's getting into water supplies, it just sets up a terrible, terrible cycle of, of reinfection. Um, this really didn't have anything to do with, with cholera, but somehow I, th I thought it was funny. I, I still have that five-year-old living inside me that thinks anything like this is funny. But, but it actually is a serious, serious problem because, I mean, one of the major killers of neonates worldwide is still diarrheal diseases. You know, children in particular don't withstand... Um, dehydration very well, and the upset that goes along with it in terms of the, um, their, their electrolytes. So this is actually um, from, from Nicaragua. So a little bit more about the epidemiology of cholera, because this is a microbe that has evolved in front of our very eyes. Cholera has been around, epidemic cholera has been around for quite a while. We are now in the middle of our seventh documented pandemic. The first one, um, historically noted, it was in 1870. Now, we don't have, at that point, the germ theory of disease was still pretty small or, or pretty new, and so people didn't have ways to cultivate this bacteria, so we don't have any access to, to the actual isolates from, from these, some of these first um, pandemics or worldwide epidemics that, that occurred. Um, most of them come um, from Bangladesh and, and the South Asia region, and all of them were caused, as far as we know, at least the ones where we could actually um, get the bacteria from archival stocks, were all largely the same strain, slight variations on the same strain. So they had the same O or lipopolysaccharide antigen called O1, because that was the only one that was out there for a long time, at least causing disease. So this is called the classical or O1. Virulence was very high. 50% mortality was, was very common. Carrier rates were very low. So in other words, if you got the disease, if you didn't die, you were fortunate enough not to die, you got over it, the bacteria went away, and you weren't infectious any longer. So this is different. Everyone knows the story of typhoid Mary, right? Mary Mallon, who was infected by a salmonella species. Um, she was, unfortunately, a carrier because she had, she didn't know it, um, she had a chronic infection of her gallbladder with salmonella. It wasn't causing her any problems, but it was causing major problems for the households in which she was a cook and a maid. Um, so, very sad story. She ends up spending the last part of her life incarcerated for no other crime than being infected. Um, well, there was, I'm not, we won't get into that story, but Mary, Mary Mallon actually, even, every time she was released, she, since she, she was an Irish immigrant who, didn't, who wasn't well educated or well trained, she had no other way to make a living than to cook and to clean. So even though she knew that you know, some people died, especially children had died from households that she had worked in. She had no other way to, to support herself or her family, so she would just not tell people who she was and, and, and work that way. So it was, it was really kind of sad 
So she ends up dying um, on an island in, in New York Harbor, um, incarcerated for having col uh, not cholera, but salmonella. But we're talking about cholera. Um, so carrier rates are very low, classically. And eradication, we believed it could happen. Maybe it even has happened. But what's really happened is that this strain, the classic O1, has largely been replaced by a different strain, which we now call, it's still O1, but it's different. It's called El Tor. El Tor is actually a small city uh, on the Sinai Peninsula. This bacterium was isolated from pilgrims returning from Mecca um, in the first decade, or maybe the second decade of the 20th century. So what, what infectious disease physicians and epidemiologists had known for years is that, you know, anytime you had pilgrims heading to one particular area, like Mecca or any other area, um, some of them bringing with them, you know, some type of infectious disease, then suddenly all those people mixing in one particular area and then going back to their homes which this was a major way to spread diseases, especially cholera. So the World Health Organization, although it wasn't called the World Health Organization at the time, um, set up stations where they would check um, pilgrims going to or coming from religious sites like Mecca um, and give them health care so that hopefully they could cure them before they got back to, to their homelands and, and spread the disease. Well, somebody isolated a bacterium um, it was a little bit different. It was a, they called it El Tor for, for that city. This is actually now our seventh and current pandemic. It began in Sulawesi, um, the current pandemic, in about 1961, and it goes on even to this day. Um, so Sulawesi is in Indonesia. The virulence is much less. So as opposed to classic O1, which put you, it, it lays you flat. I mean... You're, you need a lot of care. You need to be in bed. Um, you're losing a lot of fluid. L4, not so much. You can still go to work. You can still function. You can still spread it to people that way. So this bacterium has evolved to be slightly less virulent because rather than have people being just sick in bed and away from work, this bacterium allows you to get out and mix and mingle and infect other people. So having a, le a lesser virulence actually is adaptive for, for this microbe. It's still lethal in some people. Um, and it actually has a much higher um, carrier rate. The first person who was known to be a carrier to have a chronic infection that didn't clear it um, was, got the unfortunate name of cholera dolores. Um, this is a, a woman from the Philippines who had a chronic infection, and so she was continually in infecting people. So it's very unlikely that we're ever going to get rid of this this micro because it's evolved um, to be be much less virulent, and we see this. I'm going to get off on a, on a tangent now because I love infectious diseases, and I've only got seven minutes left, so I don't want to go too far into this. But the organism that causes malaria, or organisms that cause malaria, there are several species of Plasmodium, um, this blood parasite that cause um, varying degrees or varying severities of malaria. The most lethal of them, Plasmodium um, falciparum, would actually kill people quite gruesomely. These people would be stuck at home in bed um, so sick that they couldn't swat away the mosquitoes. This, this was, so this didn't hurt the parasite because it relied on people being at home so sick, laying down, that they couldn't get rid of the mosquitoes. So they got bit, they were feasted upon by mosquitoes. And so now this person with a high titer of Plasmodium falciparum in their bloodstream is now basically a feeding station for mosquitoes that can come into the house at night, feed on the people, and leave and bite other people. But what happens after we invented window screens and you started putting window screens on houses? Now what happens is those same people who got sick went home sick, likely possibly dying, but now the mosquitoes can't get out. They're, you know, so we have bed nettings, we have uh, window screens. So now evolution has selected against that virulent organism because if, if that virulent organism causes somebody to be that sick, that person is now taken out of circulation in terms of the ability to spread that particular species. So what's happened is a different species of plasmodium or different species 
um, like vivax is another species that still causes um, malaria, but it's not so severe. It allows you to go to work. It allows you to go to parties. You're sick. You don't feel very good, um, but you're still, you know, and, and you might die of it, but it's going to take a longer period of time. But, but the key point is, is that you're out and you're now available for mosquitoes to bite and to spread that species. So there's been this major um, switch, the evolution to a less virulent pathogen because it actually favors transmission as opposed to, to killing, the, killing the patient right away. And that's really what we're seeing in, in the case of cholera. It's just another example of balanced pathogenicity, you know, reducing the virulence in order to gain more access to, to new hosts. Um, here's another thing that, that struck me as kind of funny. So here's a, here's a poster that was uh, from 1832 in New York um, because we've had outbreaks of cholera um, all across the U.S. surprisingly not that long ago. So in 1832, this is what people thought. So some of this advice is not bad. Be temperate in eating and drinking. That one doesn't make any sense. Avoid raw vegetables. This makes sense because... You know, if food is just being washed with water, you know, if that water is contaminated and those vegetables are not cooked, you know, this is one of the first rules about if you go um, to another country, you don't want to eat raw vegetables or things that are salads, things that have been washed in water. Unripe fruit, don't know what the hell that's all about. I don't think that was it. This is the part that I like. Abstain from cold water um, when heated. In other words, if you get overly heated, um, don't drink cold water. Don't know why that is. Maybe it means that the water hasn't been boiled. And above all, abstain from ardent spirits. So don't drink too much. And if, and if the habit has rendered them indispensable, in other words, if you're an alcoholic, just don't drink too much. So I don't think that actually alcohol is, is bad for cholera, but I think this was just a way for the public health uh, people in New York to try and take a swipe at the apple of trying to, to stop people from, from, from drinking too much. But I love this. If habit have rendered them indispensable, you're an alcoholic. Um, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Um, we actually already, already covered this earlier. So typically what I do is, so I moved this part of the lecture up and we talked about quorum sensing. So we talked about this Vibrio fishery, this marine-associated gram-negative bacterium, which now doesn't cause disease, but actually enters into a nice uh, mutualist with certain fish and, and squid. So this was the system we talked about with quorum sensing, about how they control the production of life. But this bacterium is very closely related to Vibrio cholerae. But now, instead of being a kick-ass pathogen, it's actually a mutualist um, that, that helps squid hunt at night. Without, without being um, killed by, by predators. And that's all we're going to do for today. When we pick up on Wednesday, we'll talk about um, microbial mats and biofilms.